Welcome back. So I got asked, hey, could you show the article that you talked about in the past couple of videos um, that, you, that you mentioned? And yes, here it is. And this is a real classic in corporate entrepreneurship. This is kind of one of the seminal articles by Grading Corporate Entrepreneurship by Stopford and Bad Fuller. Okay. However, in the following couple videos, we're going to talk about this particular article. The Rise and Fall of the Maryland Garen Foundry Business. And I like this article for a few reasons. One, there's not a lot of articles on corporate entrepreneurship from an international perspective, and especially not from the French perspective, although I've got uh, two different cases in, in this particular uh, playlist. But there's not a lot from an international perspective. And I think this context is so unusual. You know, it's a French context. There's a lot of peculiarities of the context itself. And then the story of Roger Oué is just so unusual. There's so many bizarre twists and turns in this case study that I really think it's worth a read. I find the whole st uh, story hilarious. Unfortunately, over the years, I have not had a single student who found anything in this story funny. But that's neither here nor there. So, this is a story of a company called Marilyn Guerin that's out of Grenoble in the south of France. And if you're following along with the history, as we'll talk about in this video, the history, and then we'll kind of talk about some of the commentary in the next video. But this is the history section. So Marilyn Guerin was, or is, was a manufacturer, a leading manufacturer of electrical apparatus. This is now part of the Schneider Group. It was acquired. It was started in Grenoble in 1929 by two gentlemen. Guess what their last names were? Marilyn and Guerin. And they were kind of the stereotypical French engineers. In fact, they went to a grande école called L'École des Armitiers. What is a grande école, or what does this école mean, even in French? You notice L'École des Arts et Métiers, the school of arts and trades. So did they go to like a community college? Because that's what it sounds like from an American perspective. But that's really not it, right? And I'm going to digress just a little bit to give you some cultural background. In France, there are kind of two, actually there's many systems, but the main systems are universities, which are all public. They, and because they're public in France, it's very, very low tuition if any tuition is charged. In fact, I think when I studied abroad in 2004 in Lyon, I don't think there was any tuition, but I think you had to pay a, uh, an administration or registration fee of like 400 euros a year or something like that. It's very low cost. And at a university, it's just like an American university in, term, in the sense that you can study any number of subjects that you wish. You want to study engineering, fine. You want to study law, fine. Medicine, fine. Whatever. You can pretty much study any subject that you wish. Although, unlike the United States, there's not like a general education system. So let's say, you know, any school I've taught at the, in the United States, you know, you start off, you've got to take a little English, a little history, a little science, you know, a little really not so much in the French system. So if you're a law major right off the bat, because law is an undergraduate degree in Europe, um, you take law right off the bat. You're not going to be taking courses in chemistry. No. If you're a history major, it's history all the way through. So there's not a lot of room for exploration. In fact, if you want to change majors, you basically have to restart your education. It's kind of an unforgiving system in that regard. But that's what you get at a university. Um, and of course, their universities don't look anything like ours in the United States. Um, you know, the idea of a campus in a lot of parts of Europe is very foreign. Uh, there might be some dorms, but at least in France, um, a lot of the dorm services are provided by an organization called CRUS, C-R-O-U-S, and I can't remember what it stands for, but it's a governmental entity, and it provides dorms for students for all uh, public universities. So you could be in a, a dorm with you know, people from three or four different, different schools, and the dorm could actually be located a little bit far away from where you're actually studying. By the same token, um, cruise cafeterias can service individuals from any university within the city. Um, so that's kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a little different system. On the other hand, you have what's called a grand école, a big or a grand school. And these are uh, private for the most part, although I think there's some exceptions. Uh, you normally, after high school, you take a couple of years of what they call preparatory, prepa, and at the end of your one or two years of preparatory, you take some sort of a competitive exam that will more or less determine whether or not you get a place um, at a grande école or not. And of course, if you don't, 
uh, get a good enough score, maybe you take another year to get a better score, or you pretty much go to university. Some universities will give you credit uh, for taking preparatory courses, but some won't. Um, but it's very prestigious to go to a grande école in France, and, uh, and really the, kind of the best and the brightest go. Typically, these are one subject schools. You know, I went to a grande école for my graduate school, but it was a business school. If you wanted to study chemistry or law, I mean, that just wasn't possible. You had to, take, you had to go somewhere else for that. So it was only business and business related disciplines. Um, so they obviously went to a grande école, they called des arts métiers, arts and trades. And kind of the culture of a lot of these schools is that the people that graduate from these schools really know best. And I think Marilyn and Garrett really embodied this French attitude. Because for Marilyn and Garrett, they were integrated at the 80% level. They made, you know, not just electrical apparatus, but they also made the screws, the springs, the insulators, everything. Because they didn't think that a contractor could do it to their exacting standards. They had to do all that stuff in-house. There was no contracting. Um, obviously, they, the theory of transaction cost economics did not enter their head in the 1930s. So, that's kind of the, the early uh, phase of it. And in the 1950s, what they wound up doing is they decided to have a foundry that would pr produce some of the components for their main factory. So, the foundry started as basically a way to have an internal market to produce uh, certain components. Um, and, you know, by the 50s, the foundry was producing about, uh, was employing about 350 people, and it had a sales volume of about $3 million. Now, it did have some external business, but it was really for internal Maryland Garen customers. It was kind of, for the most part, not really at the break-even level, but it hit it a few times. Now, the phase two of this internal venture, they hire... Roger Uwe, who is this brilliant, charismatic, likable engineer who's a, great, who's a great leader. And he was hired as the foundry director. And he was an expert in aluminum foundries, and especially with the casting and solidification of aluminum alloys. And so what do they tell Roger to do? We want you to produce high-quality, high-performance alloys for us, um, and that have a, a kind of a better uh, feeling of control and, and shapes. So what does Roger develop? He developed something called uh, Preciel, Precision Aluminum Casting, and that was a great product. It became fully operational in 1965. And what winds up happening is this becomes kind of an obsolete process. So what do they wind up doing? Um, they wind up targeting the French aviation ministry, uh, aviation min uh, ministry and they wind up selling some of these aluminum products for the Mirage F1, that was a French fighter, fighter jet. So the Precial winds up becoming a huge component, not for Marilyn Garin, but for external customers, right? So it, the foundry goes from, okay, just producing aluminum alloys for internal Marilyn Garin, you know, electrical apparatus, to producing alloys for Dassault, the company that was making the Mirage F1, and other external customers. So this is already kind of a change. Then, some of you may have heard of the Concorde project. These were supersonic planes that flew up in the atmosphere, and I think you'd go across the Atlantic Ocean in like three or four hours, um, and that became a big deal. So they wanted producing alloys for that as well. And of course, Uwe was this brilliant engineer. He was doing all the marketing, he was going out glad, uh, glad handing, shaking hands with people. He was really the man closing the sale. He was the face of the foundry. It sounds pretty good at first, right? You've got, yes, they can produce aluminum alloys for Marilyn Garin, but they're, they've got this external market. The foundry's actually making some money. But then something happens. The pre-sale process continues to grow, but... Paul Marilyn winds up uh, hiring McKinsey consulting firm and asks him, hey, what's going on with our strategy? What do you think? And McKinsey makes a shocking recommendation. They say that the foundry, despite its successful sales for the pre sale process for you know, the, the aviation um, customers, did not align with Marilyn Guerin's overall strategy because they did electrical apparatus and the foundry was really a, a metal and alloys business and they didn't exactly jive because less and less of the foundry's projects were actually being used for Marilyn Guerin internal customers. So they said, let's divest the foundry. 
that's the logical thing to do. Take the money that you get from selling the foundry and invest it in your main business. Furthermore, in 1972, the production of the Concorde stopped. So the main customer for Roger Uwe's um, projects actually no longer exists. So it starts to make more and more sense that you would sell the foundry. But Roger Uwe was not to be daunted. He was a charismatic guy. He managed to convince the founders of the company, let's keep the foundry on. This is a good product. Just to, he, he just he could sell anything to anybody. He was a charismatic guy. And something interesting happens. He's at an airport. He's at LAX airport in Los Angeles. And he meets a French metallurgist who remembered that silver traces added to aluminum copper alloys increase the tensile strength. So he winds up using this little bit of knowledge to do some experimentation. And what does that experimentation do? It winds up being used to create advanced armor for the French defense industry. So once again, he's selling all this stuff to these external uh, customers. Guess what winds up happening? They keep Roger Uwe on for even longer as with his foundry. Eventually though, uh, in uh, the 1980s, Alcoa comes along, which is a major steel producer, and they decide to buy the Marilyn Guerin foundry. And it's kind of an act of goodwill. They keep Roger Uwe on as the, the president of this uh, operation at first, but eventually, um, eventually what winds up happening is they make Roger Uwe the director of research and development. So he's no longer really running the foundry. The foundry becomes less competitive and it's something that eventually winds up closing down. So in the next video, we're going to talk about some of the implications for corporate entrepreneurship based on this brief history. Hope you've enjoyed this video. If you do, give me a thumbs up, comment below, and make sure you subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.